Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, this paper. That, um, we're going to present in Europe. So it's like work with Joe and Brian's um, Tom, George, and on it. Um, so I guess the main kind of motivation for this paper is to kind of like take you know, all this like continuous time process stuff that people have been doing on um, continuous data and then just like like putting that over to the, the discrete data case. So I guess motivation for discrete data um, is quite common. You get a lot of like data sets that, you know, you don't have continuous values, say like, I think music is a bit of like, it's definitely one because I put it in here because we do an experiment on it. But I think the main one people are gonna be interested in is text where, you know, each token is like a discrete value. Um, you also have uh, kind of autoencoders that sometimes have a latent space that is discrete. Um, and then people do like latent space modeling with discrete latent spaces. Um, and also images. Um, <clears throat> usually, I mean, people treat images as continuous data. So you would like uh, rescale to like minus one to one and then treat it as a continuous value in there. But if you actually like look at images, da image data on the computer, each pixel, or each pixel channel is just like one value from, from zero to 255. So you could like theoretically model that as discrete data as well. Um, so, you know, I think we've seen this kind of like idea quite a few times in this group, but uh, the main idea is you have some like structured data uh, that I have at the top there, and you define some like noising process that corrupts that data they're like adding like uniform noise or in the um, continuous data space, they're like adding Gaussian noise. And then you get to some kind of noisy distribution that doesn't have any structure. And the important thing about that noise is um, it's easy to sample from. Like if you manage to say in the continuous, uh, continuous data space, add enough Gaussian noise that you are then kind of just, um, if you destroyed all the original structure and it's just like Gaussian now, you can sample from that. So then if you were then able to reverse that noising process in this like generative process, you can then go from this noise back to the, the structured data. And that's the idea here is we create a generative model by sampling this noise and then applying our learned generative process to, to go back to the structured data. Um, so previous uh, methods for denoising models on discrete data, they consider the model as this um, discrete time uh, Markov chain, basically. So for your noising process, you start at your data point, start of your chain, and then you apply um, big K number of like forward um, transition steps by like the kernel Q, K plus one given K. So that might say just um, take, each dimension and have a small probability of switching it to like any other one of the discrete states. So that'd be like adding uniform noise. Or maybe it could be like an absorbing kernel. So like each um, dimension has a small probability of transitioning to this like masked absorbed state. So if you apply that enough times, eventually you've either like made all the data transit to some random other discrete state or you've like absorbed all the data. So that's like how you can corrupt it. And then that defines this joint distribution over um, x naught to xk. And then you can also write that joint distribution using uh, a reverse decomposition where you start q big k from this like noisy distribution, like the marginal of um, the forward at xk. And you have a series of like backwards kernels instead. And you can get the backwards kernel um, just from uh, Bayes rule. So it's, um, it's equal to the forward kernel and then corrected by this ratio of marginals of the um, uh, like noising process. So the idea for your generative model is somehow we're going to approximate this reverse uh, kernel because we don't have access to those marginals um, analytically. So we're gonna have to approximate that somehow. So what you do is you um, uh, create a model which is going to be parameterized by theta, 
which is um, looks very similar to the true reverse decomposition, but instead of QK, which is like your noisy um, marginal at time K, you replace it with something that's very close to that that you can sample, so it's like uniform over the state, and you then apply this like learned reverse kernel multiple times, um, and I've put this equation here down just so that we can see the link between this and like denoising models, like why they call denoising models. So technically you could use kind of like any learned parameterization for this reverse kernel, k given k plus one, but um, you can write it in terms of um, like a distribution going to naught from k plus one. So this is like a distribution predicting the clean data point x naught given your like current noisy data point xk plus one. And then you give that like some parameters theta. So you have some method to learn a model that can predict the clean data point corresponding to a noisy data point, plug it into a formula, and then you get your like reverse kernel. So it's all like that. That's the standard approach so far. Um, and again, you would learn that, like the way you would learn that denoising model is um, just like the elbow. So you, uh, you're trying to uh, maximize a lower bound on the assigned data likelihood of your data points. And since you kind of like have this like joint decomposition, you just like plug that in to your elbow um, and you kind of get a tractable training of bits of that. So kind of going over a, like a pictorial representation of what I just said, you start at time one with uh, structured discrete data and you step through a series of noising uh, transition kernels. So say in this example at time t equals two, this like B state in the middle has transitioned to like some random other sample, say it's transitioned to state M and then apply the transition state again and some other states have started transitioning and as you can see, as you apply more and more of them, you destroy more and more of the data and the structure until at the end, you've just kind of got this like random sample from uniform noise. And then as I showed before, you, you learn this reverse kernel uh, with the parameters theta that is kind of learning to undo each step of time. And to generate new like synthetic samples, you would start at noise and you would just apply your like learned reverse kernel multiple times. So this is the discrete time idea. And we kind of take this idea and like move to continuous time instead. So it's the same kind of general concept where you start. So now we're starting at time naught with our clean, our clean structure discrete data. And then we have some kind of noising process that slowly destroys structure in that discrete data. Until at time big T, you get to uh, a sample from like, or approximate sample from uniform noise. So instead of having having like a discrete finite number of like transition kernels, we're going to instead like have this um, this rate of um, corruption. So at each like time, we have a certain rate at which states transition to other states, and what we're going to do is like for each dimension, we'll have some rate at which it transitions to like any of the other states. So this will be like a uniform noisy rate. And you can see here, like um, we don't have discrete steps, but we have this like continuous process. And I've marked on say some example, red transition points in time where a state has transitioned to another state. And these kind of like transitions can occur at any time in the interval, like T0 to TT rather than like, it can only happen at time two, it can only happen at time three. Um, and then we do the same idea where we um, start at this like uniform sample from noise and we kind of like parameterize this generative process that is uh, reversing that going from uniform sample of noise back to structured discrete data. Um, so this, instead of having our like corruption rate, we're now having a, a generative rate that we're learning with parameters theta. So it um, kind of like takes as input this like currently noisy data point and gives you like rates at which it should transition such that if you were to uh, 
kind of simulate with this rate, it would kind of go back up the process and, and generate uh, clean discrete data. And as we, as I showed in the previous slide, you can write this um, generative transition kernel going from like k plus one to k way back in time through some denoising model that takes a noisy data point and, and like kind of estimates what the clean corresponding data point is. And we play like the exact same trick here where this generative rate at time t, we're gonna define through um, denoisy network that we have trained to um, take in a noisy piece of data and predict um, what the corresponding clean data point is. And that's going to guide the generative process. Um, like I've written here, the output is like categorical probability. So like over each dimension, what's the probability of like each state? So you can see like the A's have some high probability there and so the B's have high probability. Um, so now like gonna go through this idea, but kind of like what the actual maths are behind. So first like kind of a small introduction to the idea of continuous time Markov chains. So in the discrete time case, we were operating it with discrete time Markov chains where we you know, um, start at some initial distribution and then we apply a finite number of transition kernels. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna start at some state and then we're going to like go forward in time continuously and have kind of like some rates at which we transition to other states. So what that looks like, if you have like a single dimensional continuous time Markov chain, is say we start in state three and then um, at some time T1, which isn't like a fixed beforehand, you don't really know when T1 is gonna be, but at some point T1, it then jumps to another state and then it stays in that state for some amount of time. And then there's another time T2, it transitions to another state. So you kind of get this like jump, like you jump around to another state and then you wait and then you jump around to another state. Uh, and you don't know beforehand when these times are. They can be like any time in this interval. So how you um, kind of write that down in maths is you know, when I said kind of you wait in a state for a certain amount of time, you have these like exponentially distributed waiting times with mean um, new x. So it's like depends on the current state you're in, depends on like that will affect how long you're waiting in that state. And then when that exponential timer has run out, you need to jump to another, another state. So then you have this kind of uh, transition kernel that we're quite used to just like what's the current state and then gives you probabilities that you've jumped to any of the other states. Um, so that's like an intuitive uh, way to write it down based on like the previous schematic diagram. Um, but you can also write it down in this kind of um, like infinitesimal generator formulation where you, you're considering the like transition kernel over like an infinitesimally small period of time. Um, and like kind of hand way we wait to write that down is um, if you're in like X tilde state at time T minus small dt, um, then there's like probability that you transition to state uh, X is this like chronic delta X X tilde. And then this term uh, with the dt, but here is like where our rate matrix comes in. And this is defining kind of like the speed at which certain states transition to other states. So like, this is like this alternative formulation to write down the continuous time marker chain. And then you can find, um, at least in the like time homogeneous case, these links between this uh, rate matrix R and um, the like holding times. So like your holding time in a state X is exponentially distributed by this rate uh, formula for R and the same thing um, for the state transition kernel. So you know, we have these two alternative formulations that you can like go between using these equations. So what we're gonna do uh, next is we're going to use this rate matrix and this is going to, what we're gonna to use to like one, define the production process and then we're going to find the reverse rate to go in the other direction. Um, yeah, so kind of like what I just said, you, for the forward process, you have some rate matrix we're gonna like have depend on time t and then, um, you know, that kind of defines some the process going forward in time. And then you just like write down what the um, time reversal of that is. 
and that gives you another continuous time Markov chain going in the reverse direction. And you can write down, you know, this has a different rate, RT hat. Um, and what we're going to do is like somehow relate RT hat to RT. And that's going to give us our way to like reverse the noising process. Um, and I think it's, it helps to kind of keep in mind what the discrete time case is. So you kind of like know what's going on. So um, in the discrete time case, you have this like forward to decomposition where you're like applying um, lots of transition, forward transition kernels. And that's kind of what this first row is where you have this like infinitesimal transition kernel. And then in like the reverse direction, you just have this like different transition kernel. And that's what we like wrote down for the reverse process. Um, yeah, so like in discrete time, we use Bayes rule to go from this one to this one. And that we're going to do the same thing, but in continuous time. Um, yeah, so like, uh, just like in, in discrete time case, the kind of reverse transition kernel was the forward with the uh, ratio of marginals. Turns out it's the same thing um, in continuous time. Uh, so your like reverse transition rate, just your forward rate, um, kind of got corrected by the marginals of the noising process. But um, that's like analytically intractable, and we'll get to like how we get over that in a bit. Um, and also, I think it's like an important parameterization where uh, instead of uh, kind of like going directly for this marginal ratio, we kind of like parameterize it in terms of some uh, denoising model. So like this is just a kind of just like probability to, to go from this ratio to this formulation where you, you have this Q naught given T. So um, these, these forward transition kernels, T given naught, those are like based on the corruption process. So we can like analytically get those as long as we choose our corruption process correctly. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plug in our neural network, our denoisy neural network um, into that right hand slot. And this is going to give us our like uh, parameterized uh, reverse rate. And we're going to use that to just approximately simulate from the time reversal. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, in discrete time, we, we trained the model using the elbow. So if, like we found uh, the model likelihood that the model was assigning to the data points x naught, and we maximized a lower bound on that. And we're going to do the same thing here where you um, find the model likelihood that our now like continuous time generative process is assigning to data points x naught. And then we uh, maximize a lower bound on that. Um, the problem is like, I guess that the formula you get out is uh, a bit hard to interpret, um, but there is like, there's like a bit of interpretation you can get. So um, what we have here is um, starting on the left, we have some expectation. So you first like you pick a random time in your noising process, and then you um, sample from the marginal at that time. At that time, so you, you pick a clean data point, you noise it using your forward noising process to some time t, and then what you do is you add like one transition step. So you know in the continuous time Markov chain schematic, you had waiting time, then you transition to another state, and you wait time, and you transition to another step. What we do is we pick a pick a point pick a like marginal in the point in your noise process and you apply one step of that transition state so you have this like x and then you transition one step you get x tilde so we have these two points that are like going forward in time and then what this term is doing is you're you're maximizing the rate for the other direction of going from x tilde to x so um this is kind of how it's learning to reverse the forward process. So you, you like take one sample from your forward process for X and you, you get one step X tilde and you just like maximize the rate going in the other direction. And that's kind of like what this term is doing. Um, but it turns out you also need to like add on this term um, for like the case when like the two states are the same, but it's kind of just like falls out of that. Um, and I don't really have like a good quick explanation for it. Um, yeah, um, and this is also like a specific example of just like uh, generic uh, uh, score-based objective. So that's kind of like cool. 
Um, okay, so now I'm going to like how we actually implement this on kind of like interesting data sets. Uh, problem is when you want to say model like images or text, you're going to have like very high dimensional data points. So say like you have a paragraph, you're going to have like hundreds of tokens and each one can be like any one of like 32,000 possible tokens. So you have like very high dimensional state. So then naively your rate matrix, this like thing that is going from any state, giving the rate at which you transit into any other state, it's going to be very big. It's like state to the power dimension times state to the power dimension because it's like um, for any combination dimensions and states, like what is the rate of all of the other ones? So obviously like you can't store that um, for kind of like any problem you would be interested in. So what we're going to do is like fill this matrix mostly with zeros and then only think about things that are not zero. And then this is like much smaller and actually you can deal with. So the way we do that is um, we, when we create our forward noising process, we allow the noising process to progress independently in each dimension. So what I've got here is a schematic diagram of our noising process where D1 to D8 is our like say eight dimensional data. We start at the top with clean data and then we like run our noising process independently in each dimension. Um, and I've marked on say some examples when each process transitions to another state. Um, and what you notice is that like, if you looked at a specific point in time, you would only ever have one process transitioning because like the probability that two independent processes transition at exactly the same time is zero. So it's like you only ever have to deal with one dimension transitioning at any single time. So when we go back to our rate matrix, this is giving like rates between current state transition to any other like state. The only, the, the only ones that are non-zero are states that differ to the current state in a single dimension. So like that's immediately deleted most of this matrix with zeros by like making sure each noising process is uh, uh, in each dimension is like independent. Um, and since, you know, we had that equation for the rate matrix in the reverse direction, in, like uh, as a function of the rate in the forward dimension, this kind of like sparsity structure follows like into the reverse rate as well. So yeah, so what we do is we just, we, we have our current state and then we, we have like S times D non-zero values, like for each other state or for each other dimension, what is the rate that it, that it transitions to like uh, that new state in that dimension. So we have like much less um, kind of like non-zero non values to worry about. Okay, so now this is um, a bit more of like, how do we actually simulate a continuous time Markov chain? So um, if I go back a little bit, so we have this like formulation for the continuous time Markov chain. We have like exponentially distributed waiting times and straight transitions. We also have this like um, formulation for like this infinitesimal uh, transition kernel. So like how do you actually like simulate from a continuous time Markov chain? Um, like one way you could do it is you're in your current state and you just find this exponentially distributed mean and you wait that time and then you transition to another state. And you're like, sure you can do that. But like, as I was just saying, we only ever transition in one dimension at a time. So it's like, if you have an image, it's like only one pixel can change for every simulation step, which is like incredibly slow. So we don't do that. We want to kind of take multiple transitions in one go. So like on this diagram, instead of going from T1 to T2 to T3, you just like take a chunk of time, say like of interval tau, and you just apply all the transitions that you think occurred in that time period, apply them all at the same time, and it goes to the next time period, and then apply all of those transitions that occurred. So that's the main idea, of how we're going to simulate this efficiently. So I have a diagram that I will explain. Um, say you're at time, we're going to go reverse time, like simulating the generative process. So you're at time t and you're, and we're currently in this state 
um, is this big black dot. And we're in a two-dimensional problem with five states. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to like leap, let's call it tau leap. We're going to leap uh, back in time of time tau. And we're going to apply all of the transitions that occurred during that uh, time period. So um, say if we like actually simulated it properly, it might have transitioned that way once um, and that way. Um, but uh, the thing is, since we don't actually step through all this time, we have to assume this state holds constant during this time period. So what we do is like, even though it, it said it wanted to transition that way, we hold this state constant in this state here. Um, so when it transitions that way, we don't actually apply that transition. So it stays here. So it technically it could transition in that way again. So what you get is this, um, a number of transitions in some dimensions, and you, you can get like some transitions in that dimension, some transitions in that dimension. And then when you get to T minus tau, you apply all of those transitions that you think happened simultaneously. And then so like, you like move that way and that way twice. And then that's your, your, your tau looping step. So what, like what the assumptions of tau looping are is one in this time period T to T minus tau, you assume your state remains constant. And you also assume that your rate matrix remains constant because you know, like all my rate matrix is dependent on time. So assume that remains constant, assume the state remains constant. And then you kind of get a formula for uh, what transitions occurred in that time. So you can show that um, under these assumptions, the number of transitions from like xt to x, x tilde is Poisson distributed with um, some mean depending on the time interval and your uh, reverse rate matrix. So that's kind of uh, the way we simulate. So you kind of like pick your time interval tau and then you just like apply that multiple times, um, kind of like take the jumps in the simulation process. And that allows you to kind of like jump in many dimensions simultaneously. <clears throat> um, the problem with like tau leaping is um, obviously, we made all those approximations. We thought the state held constant in the time period. We also assumed the uh, rate matrix remained constant in that time interval. So uh, you kind of like introduce a lot of error in your simulation process. And one method that we found like works really well for um, kind of like correcting those errors is this like predictor corrector step. So in continuous data space, people have done this where um, you have a predictor correct that is kind of like integrating your SDE in the reverse direction, and that's your like predictor correct predictor step. And then you correct by adding like MCMC steps with a uh, like invariant distribution of the marginal of the noise process at that time. So instead of like integrating the SDE where you'd kind of like keep going back in time, you just like stay at some point in the noisy process, and then you just like apply a few like MCMC iterations to like tend towards the marginal of the noise process at that time. So say like you're integrating your um, reverse process and you've kind of like drifted away from like the true marginals of your process, then these corrector steps kind of like bring you back to um, what the true marginal is. Uh, and so people don't seem to really use it that much, like correct me if I'm wrong, in continuous data space. I think people found like other integrator methods work better. But we found you can do a similar thing in discrete state space, but for us it worked really well. Um, so like the predictor step here is now like simulating with RT hat, so just like reversing our continuous time markup chain. And if we want to create a continuous time markup chain with an invariant distribution of the noise in process at this time, like that targeting that marginal, then all you need to do is like simulate with a rate that is the reverse rate adding on the forward rate. So it's like, if you can imagine like the reverse rate's going that way and the forward rate going that way, you kind of imagine like if you add them together, you're going to like go in the sideways direction and target the marginal. Um, so we found that like, if you do a predictive step and then you add a few like corrector steps targeting your like marginal and kind of simulating a different continuous time market chain for a little bit, then you can kind of bring yourself back onto um, the kind of like true 
marginals of the reverse process and kind of like create some errors and get higher sample quality. Um, and we also like give some like theoretical results for uh, our like generative model. So, you know, once we've kind of create this generative process with our parameterized rate, then kind of in the same way in continuous data space, you can get kind of like bounds on the produced uh, distribution from your model uh, using these parameters as like under some assumption of accuracy of your um, like learned parameters, then you can, we can also bound the error or like the uh, difference in distribution between like your data distribution and the, the law of your produced samples um, using like similar techniques. So you get like a bound that um, splits into terms like, like the first term is relating to your uh, approximation error of your reverse rate matrix. And then you get a, a term based on like the tau leaving approximation. So like this is where your, your tau comes in. So it's like if you reduce tau, you can reduce the tau leaving error. And then you also get a term based on like the mixing of your forward process because um, when you apply your forward process, you get to some like end marginal, like close to uniform, and then you approximate that as uniform and you sample your generative. So, but it's like, they're not quite the same. And it depends on how fast your noticing process mixes. That's where that term comes from. Um, and then the important thing here is like, um, D is the dimension of the problem and you don't have any like exponential dependence on the dimension. So um, it's got to give you hope that it's going to work okay when you apply it to like high dimensional problems. Um, and then just like going through some quick results, uh, we applied it to like CIFAR 10 modeling because um, I mean, we can compare to previous work because that's what they did as well. Uh, so yeah, we, we consider each pixel channel to be discrete but variable from like zero to 255, one of those values. Um, and then you we apply some like noising process where each pixel channel can like jump to uh, a value nearby. You just apply that many times and you like go to some uniform noise and the it. Um, so what we found is um, these two rows are like the previous method. Um, and we found that if we add no uh, corrector steps, then our like inception score and um, I think it's called fresh A inception distance is like somewhat similar to the previous method. So these are like measuring image quality, like a like distance of your generated images in distribution to the to the data set. And we found that like um, we get like similar image quality. But then if you if we add quite a lot of corrector steps um, at the end of the generative process. So when you're like almost at the data, I found that like if you add lots of corrector steps then um, you, you get generate like much higher quality images. Um, so that like it gives you like a good boost in your uh, like sample quality metrics. And then you can kind of like semi approach uh, this, the sample quality you get when you use like standard diffusion models. It's so, like, it's still not as good as treating images as continuous um, data, but like it's definitely approaching the sample quality um, using this method. Um, and we also did some conditional alternative modeling on the music data set. So this is like a data set of um, piano MIDI files. So it's like um, each time step is just like one note on the piano. So like no chords allowed just like monophonic. Um, and then it's just a data set of like 16 bars of like some playing like notes and piano songs. And what we do is we um, learn the generative distribution of the final 12 notes of that song conditioned on the first two bars. So like someone gives you the intro and then you have to like predict what the um, continuation of that song is. So it's like on the left you have the original song and then on the right you have conditioned on those first two bars what does the model predict the song kind of like finishes as and you can see like the model kind of gets it quite well um following like the style and, and kind of like note range that is included in the um, introduction um, which is quite cool um yeah i think that is uh my final slide, so thank you for listening
I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I just had a question on the installation. So you mentioned at the beginning that there's been there was a lot of work on there's been a lot of work on on this in for the street data and doing like a fixed number of uh, noisy steps, right? Yeah. So what's the motivation for viewing this problem in terms of continuous stuff? Um yeah, so it's I think it's mostly around um test time flexibility. So like when you're in discrete time, you only learn to denoise at those specific time points. And then you're also limited to simulating just those by just applying all those reverse tunnels. And that's like, that's what you can do. But here, um, we learn to denoise at like any arbitrary time step in the process. So then we have the same learned model and we can then say simulate with a small time and simulate very fine and kind of get good, get good quality. But if we wanted a more efficient method, we could use the same trained model and have a big tau and simulate um, kind of with the coarser and have a much more efficient method. Um, you can kind of do a similar thing in discrete time, but it's like, it's, you don't have quite as much flexibility. Um, and the second thing is uh, a lot of people who work on continuous time market chain simulation. So in the same way, like a lot of people who work on ODE simulation and SD like have found you know, they can speed up continuous time or continuous state space diffusion models using their knowledge of like how to simulate an ODE. We have the same thing can happen here. It's like people who know how, how to simulate continuous time micro chains. Maybe they can see like how to speed up um, this simulation as well. Uh, so, but it's like, if you don't go into this continuous time space, you don't really see the link between how you can, you know, speed up these like discrete time micro chains. Um, kind of like, where the connection is to the, to the other literature. Yeah, I guess another question. So the, the bounds on the errors that you got before, is that with um, or without applying any correct steps? Uh, I think it's without any correct steps, just like uh, And if you were to, is there, like, do you have any idea what the, like how much the corrective steps improve um, on this segment? Mm, I'm not sure if I'm, I don't know. <laughs> do you have any idea? <laughs> so, probably you still have like a term that's going to be roughly linear in how, like, so long as it's something like. At least how long? Maybe without going into details, maybe like the exponential time can do loops because, but like that's not really the problem anyway, ever. And probably you keep something proportional to m just because if even if you any correct step that your that your approximation is wrong, you're going to do. I imagine it maybe makes it better. It probably doesn't like, reduce the order of either of those two points. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, trying to stop the recording.